but because we're mixing things up a little bit this morning, he wanted to get to Kevin Kilban before he gets on that boat for the final uh, voyage over to the Premier League weekend. Kev, how are things? <laughs> Yeah, all oh, good, Owen. How are you keeping? All good. Uh, we were just chatting about Spurs there. As a week, as a whole, have you ever seen the likes of it over the past couple of days? I don't remember a week like it. I don't remember so many so many shocks. Even even last night, if you look at it, the drama of the penalty shootout with, with Chelsea and Eintracht Frankfurt, you know, it was obviously on a, it was minor compared to the, to the other two games. Liverpool, that turnaround was just incredible. And then... Tottenham get to half time, you know, obviously you're three quarters of the way through a game, you're three nil down, you need the three goals to, to do it. it. It was, it was an incredible day, stuff for fantasy. I know you boys are all into your Game of Thrones and everything, aren't you? And, you know, and, and obviously pure fantasy. I've, I've got plenty of fantasies that's never ever going to happen in my life, but that was just incredible. Know, okay. Yeah, there you Keep go. Clean. <laughs> oh, yeah, not, not on, on a different scale, Anthony. Not oh, okay. <laughs> it's a bit too early for that. <laughs> <laughs> Should have given a parental warning there. Uh, we, we'll come back to that in just a moment, but let's start with this Sunday, Kev. Like, they can't, can they, Liverpool? Surely, surely not. This, this week surely can't get any better for them. Well, I, I mean, the way I'd look at it this weekend, can you imagine Liverpool get an early goal, word starts filtering through down to Brighton, Liverpool have got an early goal, and City get edgy. City have been edgy the last couple of weeks. Most of the games that I've seen them play, Burnley game, certainly very, very edgy. The Leicester game, very, very edgy. And... It's taken that one goal and I mean, certainly the company goal, that came out of nothing and Leicester still caused them a lot of problems. So let's, let's wait and see. I, I, I expect City to win. I think they will win. You know, I, most of us who have been chatting over the last month or two, I don't think anyone probably expected both sides to, to remain in the last, last 10, 10 games or so and, and win every match. But I still think City have got enough. I think they're a little bit fresher now that the games have been more staggered. You know, they had, they, I think they had an eight-day break going into the Leicester match where they didn't play well. Now they've got a bit more of a break coming into this game. So I, I think City will be a lot fresher. Kev, I know you're back there. This idea yeah. of so these... It's a nightmare when somebody rings you. Someone rings you and you're on Skype and then you, you actually lose your signal, don't you? It's not great. Yeah, we, we, need, we need to figure out some, some better modern technology, <laughs> I think, Kev. Like, um, Miguel Delaney was writing in um, The Independent in London yesterday morning about uh, the whole idea of the comeback in uh, the Champions League at the moment, the way that ever since that ridiculous Barcelona comeback against Paris Saint-Germain two seasons ago, we've become conditioned to this a little bit more because it's happening a little bit more often because there's more adventurous yeah. style of play. Yeah, I think that's probably the way. Uh, I, I mean, I think Liverpool, I, I don't think anyone truly probably wrote Liverpool off the way that they play. I think they're the better side for probably nine-tenths of the game over the over the two legs against Barcelona. They certainly had large spells even, even over in Barca that they, that they could have scored, perhaps should have scored in that game. I, I thought when Salah missed that chance at 3-0, I thought this is probably going to be beyond them now. And and that was kind of how it went. Tottenham was a little bit different. I think they were outplayed for long spells, certainly up to maybe for three quarters of the game, as I was saying before. And I just heard the back end of what Anthony was saying there. It wasn't necessarily tactically geni tactical genius uh, from, from Pochettino, but what, it, what he recognised was that you've got the best, the best defender or considered the best defender in Europe with De Ligt and get it forward to Laurenti. Now, that's one thing that stood out to me straight away. It's maybe something else we can look at further down the line. I don't think, or I think uh, Matthias De Ligt would struggle playing in the Premier League with a type of an Ashley Barnes, um, yeah. you, know, you know, that type of striker because he simply couldn't handle the physicality of it and the pace of it. So I think what, what Tottenham did was, was very different from what Liverpool did. Liverpool got momentum at the start of the game and they went for it. So... Yeah, maybe maybe sides have got that sort of momentum from it. I mean, even if I think back to the to, to the Man United PSG game, Man United didn't really play well. I personally think they didn't deserve to go through. I thought the, the handball was a bit of a joke in my mind, but it was given for them. So this season we've seen the comebacks. Yes, is is it because of that Barcelona game? Perhaps, but I, I just think Liverpool deserve to go through more than anybody. And I think Liverpool, with the style of football that they play, they can they can blow away anybody. And uh, I mean, I think across the course of this season, I think I mean, maybe even the last the, across the course of the last two seasons, Liverpool have played the most entertaining football at Champions League level. Yeah, I just want to come back to the point you made about the lick there because it's an interesting one. This idea that perhaps there's stylistically he wouldn't be fully suited to the Premier League if he were to come to the Premier League. Say hypothetically, Manchester United were to sign him or any club were to sign him. How do you get the best out of a defender like that in the Premier League? 
Sorry, sorry, just say that last bit there again, Owen. Sorry. I'm just wondering how you would get the best out of De Ligt in the Premier League were he, to, were he to join the league, because he's obviously an incredibly talented player, but as you say, there may be an element of him that isn't fully suited to the league. Well, if he, if he went to the Premier League, you'd probably look at... He's, he's going to go to Man City, Chelsea or whoever it's going to be. He's going to play in, in a top side and they dominate possession. So it's about how you get at them, isn't it? And sides struggle to do that. But the way that I, I was looking at, uh, at, at Mateus De Ligt and, and, how, and how he plays, any, any sort of ball that's played down the sides of him, he can deal with it. He's got a little bit of pace. Looks, looks a little bit heavy to me and I don't know if he's got that sort of body that might struggle with, with weight issues as, as he goes forward in his career. But... Certainly high balls played to him. Lorenti, I mean, you know, I, I, we've all watched football. Lorenti is not the most physical of strikers. He's not the sort of, he's not really that type of player that's going to go and throw an elbow back into back into into defenders. I've not necessarily seen that from him on a consistent basis. But in that game, it was needs must for him. And he was told, with one, he was given one specific instruction, go and back in, go and hit diagonal balls to them. I don't know if you noticed as well in the lead up to the game, what, what Tottenham had actually done... They put Toby Alderweireld to right back, and they brought Musa Sissoko inside to centre half. That was larger for the fact was they wanted to hit diagonal balls, and I think they must have felt Alderweireld had better quality of hitting those diagonal balls. But the ball actually came from Sissoko from a central area, just the clearance, just going long. So there were little things that happened in the game as well that that uh, that, that that maybe that maybe would have happened differently if if, if certain players were in probably the regular positions. But in relation to Delict. I think the Ligt might take a little bit of time to adjust. And I've, I mean, I've, I've played with centre halves. I remember we had, we signed a player for, for Everton. We paid five million for him. Um, I'll think of his name in a second. He ended up playing for Fiorentina. He ended up having a good career for him, uh, for himself. He came to the, he came over to us in training, and we had youth team players that were that were destroying him. He couldn't he couldn't deal with players backing into him because he doesn't get players that's playing with the back to goal. That, that really liked to go and roll defenders. He couldn't deal with it. And in training, we knew straight away that he was never going to be able to deal with it physically. And whether or not that's going to be the case with Delict, because everything that he's playing with Ajax is in front of him. He's never he doesn't necessarily play with the defender that's going to have that that ability to back into him. So that was my own observation that came from it straight away that I thought he'd struggle playing against the that type. You know, and Ashley Barnes, um, who's the lad down at Brighton, the striker down at Brighton. Glenmore. That type. Yeah, Glenn Murray, that, that, that type of player that, would, that, that loves the physicality and likes to play touch tight with centre-halves. Is it not something you can coach, though, uh, Kevin, or is it just, yeah. you know, it has to be in you from a kind of young, early day? Like, I mean, yeah, you know, I, from juvenile level or from youth level? You, you, you know yourself, Anthony, any, anything, can, any, anything can be coached, but, you know, we, we might be at the stage if, if Man City signed Delict, and we might be three months down the line thinking, this guy is hopeless. And all of a sudden then, it's, he's almost written off before he has time to go and, to go and have yeah. a career. It might just take that little bit of time where over a year, 18 months, we may see then a player that's gone on to the next level, like a Van Dijk, that can deal with everything physically, but also can deal with the other side of the game as well, where he's able to step in and he's able to play because he's got that to his game anyway. So yes, mm. it can, it, of course it can be coached, but... It's just the nature of the of the Premier League when, when these big signings come in, they, they seem to be written off so quickly because of uh, because of the start that they've made at certain careers. I'm yeah. not saying that's going to be the case, but that was my initial observation with it. The, the common thread that's run through the, the Liverpool and the Spurs comeback this week, Kev, is the squad mentality, and it's such a, a cliche. It's thrown about so much that you know even players who are are fulfilling a, a bit part role with a team on the bench most weeks in the Premier League that they can come on and still be happy to play that part. How difficult is that to actually instill that level uh, of a squad mentality from Maurizio Pochettino's perspective or from Jurgen Klopp's perspective? Yeah, it, it can be difficult. Everybody wants to play. Everybody wants to be in the starting eleven or, or whatever whatever team game you're playing. You want you want to be on the on the starting panel. That's that's the way that it is. And I think that that's always the case. I think for a coach, for a manager, to keep the squad motivated. You know, it didn't happen too often, Owen, as you know. But if I if I was ever out of the side. Um, <laughs> Do you know what it is? I, th I think it, it's more th that that five-day period invariably that we would have Monday, Monday to Friday that you would have. What you're going to do physically? How how does a manager tell a player, look, lads, you've got to come off, you've got to do, you've got to go and do a bit extra. The, the first team squad now, or the first team 11, 10 outfield players have done their bit now. You've got to come over, and it's you know it's your job essentially. You you know you're paid to do it, and you've got to keep yourself motivated, knowing full well that. Any given day, a player can get injured, and you've got to be prepared to step into it. But 
there are players that, and, and there has been across my career, players with attitudes that literally will just switch off. If, if they're told they're coming away from the main group and they're coming to do extra training with the extra 10, 15 players or whatever it is, it, they're not happy. And, and the attitude, the, some attitudes do, their attitude, attitudes do stink and that's the way that it is. But it's, um, it's difficult. That, that is the difficult, I think, in modern day professional sports, modern day, modern day sport in general, is to keep the players that aren't starting regularly uh, motivated and happy. There's one other thing I wanted to get your take on before we wrap up, Kev, and it, the one of the elements that hasn't been discussed that much is, is Barcelona after Liverpool, because rightly we've been focusing on the positives over the past few days, but just reading Eni Aluko in The Guardian this morning, uh, she said, Tuesday was not the first time that I've seen Lionel Messi when his back is against the wall, either for Barcelona or for his country, somehow look sorry for himself. When his teams need leadership and look to him, sometimes he just seems to have a blank expression. You know what? I, I'm, I I can't. I don't necessarily agree with criticism of Lionel Messi over over a ninety minute game. I mean, what is he, he's, he's approaching fifty goals again this season, isn't he? And how, how many times I, I've watched Barcelona this season? Many times when Barcelona have been dead and buried, in it and he's had to pull something out of that. Players cannot do that every single game. Mm. It just it just doesn't happen. No matter how good you are, that players can do a certain job. Fabinho did a great job on him, and that was a thing that maybe that has maybe been overlooked to an extent that Fabinho went and nailed him early. Andy Robertson nailed him early. There was a couple of players that got got around him very quickly. And players, some players, when they're put off the, off the stride to an extent, can't replicate a, a certain type of performance. I, I, I mean, I actually heard now Quinn and Brian Kerr were talking about the other night in the studio as well after the game. And they, they were going along those sort of lines is that Barcelona might need a rethink. They might need to change change it up. Maybe even the unthinkable of get rid of Messi, but it is, it's simply not going to happen. Messi has, has saved Barcelona far too often. I think he can play in different roles. I think we're going to see Messi in the next five, six years play a little bit of a deeper role, maybe the type of role that Xavi or Iniesta would have played with are actually maybe coming onto the ball a lot more. And he's played that to an extent across the course of this season where he have, has played deeper, but he does have a freer role where he can move forward for, from a deeper position. So I don't see, I don't see Lionel Messi... I don't. I, I can't see how we can judge him off off one game because there has been games like, even 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 look at the comeback against PSG, when the the, the game they were four 0 down. The first game over in PSG, he was anonymous, and there has been games at at the real elite level over the last few seasons when Barcelona have got to a quarter or a semi final. He hasn't been able to replicate the, the form that we know he can show, but he's a class act. I think I think you know you can't get away from that, can we really? Kev, we'll uh, let you go, and because I think that boat is about to take off in about four minutes. Just before that, um, <laughs> yeah, I think we're moving. We're on the move. We're on the move on. Yeah, uh, well, stay, the, stay on while we've the, got a signal. The, the, the Wi-Fi is holding up just for now. Um, are Manchester City going to be lifting the Premier League trophy on Sunday? Uh, yeah, it, well, it's not an absurd, it's not an absurd, absurd uh, prediction, is it? Let's be honest, but mm. I, I do think so. Yeah, I, 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 I can't see them going down to Brighton and not being motivated. You know, the one last hurdle that they've got to get over. It's been an incredible run. But as I said, if Liverpool get 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 a goal and word does get down to um, uh, to, to Brighton that they've, that they've got themselves in front, then yet yeah, nerves and that edginess can creep in. But I, I can't see. It. I think they've got too much. Kevin Clavan, safe journey. Thanks a million. All the best. Cheers, lads. Full coverage of the final day of the Premier League season on Sunday's Off the Ball is coming your way with exclusive commentary of Liverpool against Wolves with Nathan Murphy and Jonathan Walters at Anfield. Stephen Doyle then will be down at the Amex to see if Manchester City can seal the title against Brighton.